The National Desk, America's News, now. Debt ceiling clash. House Republicans passed their debt limit bill, setting the table for talks with the White House. The president can no longer put this economy in jeopardy. We lifted the debt limit. We've sent it to the Senate. We've done our job. The deadline quickly approaching with wasteful spending on the chopping block. Stranded in Sudan. Americans should have no expectation of the U.S. government coordinated evacuation at this time. It is imperative that U.S. citizens in Sudan make their own arrangements to stay safe in these difficult circumstances. Fear intensifying for thousands of Americans trapped by escalating violence. The White House announcing they have no plans to save those caught in the crossfire. Arming teachers. The fact check team looks into what Americans, including the teachers themselves, think about guns in the classroom and opting out of Mother's Day marketing. Whether you're trying to conceive recently, um, lost a pregnancy, Mother's Day may bring some mixed emotions. Some customers calling it a kind gesture as companies let them decide, but conservative critics call it a war on women. From the nation's capital, this is The National Desk, America's News Now. We're glad you're with us. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. On this weekend edition, we take a look at the big headlines of the week and a look ahead at what to expect. Starting with the four big stories we're watching right now. Former Vice President Mike Pence testified Thursday to the federal grand jury investigating the aftermath of the 2020 election. And the nation's debt ceiling drama remains in a stalemate. Plus, the FAA says it's convening an independent safety review team after a string of narrowly averted runway collisions at major airports. And later on, the man accused of leaking highly classified U.S. documents online asked to be released during his trial. First, former Vice President Mike Pence testified for more than five hours this week before a federal grand jury investigating efforts to overturn the 2020 election. Pence has spoken publicly about what he calls Trump's pressure campaign to block Congress from certifying Joe Biden's victory. Two reports out this week show mixed signs about the U.S. economy and your money. The economy show, slowed sharply from January through March to 1.1 percent in the first quarter of this year. And that's lower than the expected 2% and much lower than the second half of last year. This signals interest rate hikes are having an impact. Federal officials say another hike is coming. If the data come in as I expect, uh, we will be able to hold there for quite some time. So once we get to that point, I don't have us really doing anything uh, but monitoring the economy for the rest of this year and into 2024. Now to the new jobs report. It looks like most employers are holding on to their workers. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says first-time jobless claims fell to 230,000 last week. President Biden and Vice President Harris officially announced their 2024 re-election bid. Right now, polls show the economy and inflation continue to be top issues for voters. And while President Biden touts improvements in those areas, they could still be a headwind for the Biden-Harris campaign. The National Desk, Atra el Nishar reports. The President of the United States, Joe Biden. President Biden, once again, a presidential candidate. In his first remarks since launching his campaign Tuesday, promoting his economic agenda. It's time to finish the job. Drawing a contrast with Republicans. They believe the best way to grow the economy is from the top down. And then to watch the benefits trickle down to the rest of us. A new poll by The Economist and YouGov shows American adults continue to rank inflation and jobs in the economy as their top issues. But the president's approval ratings on both issues are underwater. We will get through this together. When President Biden took office in January 2021, the nation was still reeling from the pandemic. Vaccines not yet widely available, the economy essentially at a standstill. Unemployment was 6.3%. Now it's tied for a 50-year low at 3.5%. Annual inflation was just 1.4%, spiking over the next year and a half, peaking at 9.1%, falling last month to 5 percent. 
I know that there's a lot of pessimism out there and it, it, you can't ignore the fact that there is high inflation or at least relatively high inflation. At this juncture, I don't see the economy being a slam dunk for uh, the incumbent, in this case, Biden, or something that's going to be a big negative. Because again, the economy is solid, it's sound, it's not doing great, it, it's doing good. Economic issues have plagued one-term presidencies in the past. High unemployment under President Gerald Ford, soaring inflation under President Jimmy Carter, and under President George H.W. Bush, sluggish GDP growth and a soaring poverty rate. Those conditions are far worse than the present, but that's not stopping the president's opponents from making it a target. In Washington, I'm Atrel Nishar for the National Desk, America's News Now. Idra, thank you. 3M is the latest manufacturing company to announce mass layoffs, signing a possible recession. The company behind post-it notes and scotch tape says it's laying off 6,000. Previously, 2,500 lost their jobs in January. 3M says the layoffs will reduce costs by up to $900 million annually. Keeping an eye on your money, Americans appear to be a little more worried about the economy these days. U.S. consumer confidence fell to 101.3 in April, down from 104 in March. And this marks the third time in four months that overall consumer confidence has dropped. Inflation and jobs top their concerns, and they expect things to get worse in the next six months. Spring fever hits the housing market. Nationwide, home prices increased in February, breaking a seven-month streak of declines. So what does this mean for the economy? Janae Bowens has the details. Housing experts say rising home prices are a good sign that people are returning to the market. Trevon Gross has got his hands full, working as a full-time entrepreneur, prepping for a wedding, and he's now looking to buy a home. I'm in the process of trying to decide you know, what works best uh, for me and my family. Trevon's not alone. More Americans are entering the housing market, and that demand for homes is actually pushing prices up. According to the S&P CoreLogic Case-Shiller National Home Price Index, home prices rose 0.2% in February. That increase is the first one since June. They are kind of coming back to the market a little bit reluctantly, but a little bit which is a good sign. Now, many are reluctant, not just over housing prices, but interest rates too. It, it's astronomical. According to Freddie Mac, as of April 20th, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage averaged 6.39%. A year ago, it was 511 And in 2021, it was just 2.97%. Like, do I really want to, you know, commit to a 7% interest rate? Or do I want to stick it out and wait and just see what happens? Andy Winkler, Director of Housing and Infrastructure Project at the Bipartisan Policy Center, advises not to wait. And if you buy a house at a higher rate, you can always refinance down the road to a, a loan with a lower rate. And remember, the Fed is raising those interest rates to try to cool inflation. Housing prices have been sort of rising out of control for quite a while. Um, and then over the last year started to dip just a bit in that that growth um, because of the hikes in interest rates. So what I think you're seeing now are things starting to stabilize. And even though it's a complicated situation, Trevon is definitely looking to buy. The average price for a home is nearly $376,000. And the Bipartisan Policy Center is hoping our leaders in Washington work together to create more affordable housing for lower income Americans. And that was Janae Bowens reporting a gun rights group filing a lawsuit against Washington state's new rifle ban. Governor Jay Inslee signed the bill this week banning more than 60 semi-automatic rifles along with others based on length and accessories. The Firearms Policy Coalition and Second Amendment Foundation says the ban violates the Second and Fourth Amendments of the Constitution. Following the Nashville school shooting that left six dead, including three children, there have been renewed calls to arm teachers in the classroom. It's something that's already happening in parts of the country right now. Back with the fact check team, Courtney, in some states, teachers are already carrying. Right, and it's in more places than you would think. Take a look at your screen. You'll see there are around 30 states that allow teachers or other school staff to carry with certain restrictions. Many of them require teachers to have permission from the school or the school district if they're part of a certain program or have a concealed carry license.
For example, in Alabama, some administrators are allowed to carry if they complete training through the state's Sentry program and there isn't a school resource sure, officer. Rules vary by state, but that leaves just a handful of states that don't let teachers carry at all. Right. We found that there are only 16 states that don't allow teachers to carry, but then there's security personnel. Most states allow non-law enforcement security guards to carry, according to a report from Gifford's Law Center, but most require permission from the school or the school district. There are seven states that don't allow security personnel to carry on school grounds, and four of those currently have laws that don't allow any school employees to carry. Then there's Hawaii, where there's no legislation on arming teachers at all. Uh, but Connor, some states are taking up this issue right now. Yeah, that's right, Eugene. There's a few states with legislation in the works. For example, Mississippi lawmakers passed a bill last month that would create a program to allow armed and trained teachers in schools. Then in Tennessee, private school teachers can carry with the school's permission, but there's a bill in the works that would allow public school teachers to carry. Right now, and this is interesting, Indiana already allows teachers to carry, depending on the district, but last week, state senators advanced a bill that would give funding for the teacher firearm training. Uh, lots to follow here. Ladies, thank you for your background on this. And for more on this Fact Check Team topic, including links to the Fact Check Team sources, you want to scan the QR code on your screen or visit us online at thenationaldesk.com. The U.S. government claimed Tuesday that they have the tools to pursue companies that abuse artificial intelligence and that they're ready to use it. U.S. regulators said existing laws would allow them to take action against companies that abuse AI tech. It comes as Congress grapples with how it should take action against the technology. Right now, Southwest Airlines is reporting record revenue that despite its winter holiday service meltdown that left hundreds of thousands of passengers stranded, revenue soared 22% during the first quarter of 2023 to $5.7 billion. The service issue still resulted in a first quarter loss due to weak bookings in January and February. The number of U.S. adults smoking cigarettes hit an all-time low last year. One in nine adults said they're current smokers. According to 2022 CDC data, that makes up 11 percent of adults, down from about 12.5 percent in 2021 and 42 percent in the 60s. Ahead here on the National Desk, America's News Now, a call for help. Why firefighters in Washington state say they need more protection from people, not fire. Plus, the rare drug now showing promise for thousands of people living with ALS. The FDA's accelerated approval process happening now. The National Desk team of reporters is bringing you the headlines from coast to coast. We're taking the pulse of America, starting in the state of Washington. Seattle firefighters are asking city leaders for protection from people interfering with them as they try to do their job. While many consider firefighters heroes for the risks they take, there are others ready to interfere with their work and even attack them. We had one firefighter that was uh, that was actually kind of thrown or wrestled down a stairwell. We've had firefighters that have had rocks thrown at them. We've had people that have gotten punched. The department wants to help stop a dangerous trend that only seems to be getting worse and asked city council to make it a crime to obstruct firefighters when they're trying to knock down flames or save lives. Seconds and minutes count in our profession and distra distracting aggressive and violent acts delays our actions and our care. Firefighters say what they're asking for is some space on the street to do their work. 
and the ability to have people removed if they try to stop or even hurt them. It helps give the tool for that safety bubble that we need to be able to really focus on the patient as opposed to having one eye looking over our shoulder. Some people spoke out in council to say there are enough laws to protect firefighters and this change could be used to disperse protesters. And there's a clear pathway where this legislation serves as a tool of counter protests specifically against counter -pro um, protesters of color. So what would you say to people who are concerned that this will be used to sweep away protesters? That that was not the intent. Uh, that this strictly is about creating that little bubble. This really is a tool to protect those that are helping others. Now over to California, where experts are warning of a mosquito epidemic in the Central Valley this summer. Mosquito abatement officials in Kings County, south of Fresno, say stagnant lake water could attract millions of mosquitoes and turn hundreds of thousands of acres into mosquito breeding grounds. With water not seeping into the ground very well, they say the mosquito problem could persist for months or years, with the potential to bring diseases like West Nile virus. You know, I've been in mosquito control for over 30 years, and I've, we've, we've never seen anything close to this. Controlling the area's mosquito population could cost millions of dollars. And West Virginia is looking to boost its tourism workforce. Called Shape Our Future, a new tourism and hospitality, hospitality initiative targeting middle and high school students, highlights tourism as a career path. The older students will be eligible for college credit and certifications for certain courses with the end goal to get them working in the industry. We've all heard people say that there are no jobs in West Virginia, that you're going to have to move when you graduate, but that's not true. And today we're here to talk about explosive growth in tourism. According to the West Virginia Department of Tourism, tourism employment in the state is expected to grow by more than 20,000 job openings each year for the next three years. Up next here on the National Desk, America's News Now. Chaos in the war-ravaged region of Sudan. Thousands of Americans stuck in turmoil and fear as world leaders beg for a ceasefire extension. Hundreds dead and thousands more injured in escalating clashes around Sudan's capital city of Khartoum by rival militant factions. U.S. Special Forces evacuating U.S. Embassy personnel and their families last week. But thousands of Americans are likely still stuck in the African nation. Earlier this week, senior fellow and military expert at Defense Priorities and retired Army Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis sat down with the National Desk Jan Jeffcoat to discuss America's response to the growing crisis. Violence in Sudan and new risks of a biohazard after a lab was seized by fighters and Taiwan says it's gearing up for war in 2027. Joining us this morning is senior fellow and military expert at Defense Priorities and retired U.S. Army Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis. Good morning to you. Welcome back to the National Desk. Good morning. Sudan. Thanks for having me. First of all, tell me what you're specifically watching when it comes to Sudan and the ongoing violence there. Uh, other countries right now launching daring missions uh, to, to rescue their citizens. What will happen to other Americans still left there, do you think? You know, it's a, it's a little bit of an odd situation, I have to say, because the uh, the administration has point blank said that they're no longer taking any action uh, on the ground to get American citizens out. They say they have shifted that over to 
uh, digital means, uh, you know, other online apps and you're contacting with them on phone, et cetera. But they said that they're helping to coordinate them and move them into directions where other countries are getting their citizens out or overland routes, et cetera, those kinds of things. But the uh, they're no longer even considering, uh, you know, specifically getting people out as some of the other countries are. And uh, look, this is just such a horrible, horrible situation. It's deteriorating by the day. And, and at least uh, as of this morning, uh, most of the United Nations officials are saying there is no prospects for any kind of negotiated settlement because both sides think they can win the fight. And there is word this morning, Lieutenant Colonel, that fighters have taken over the central public health lab. They're obviously creating this biological risk since there are pathogens and viruses there that could leak. How concerning is this to you and what kind of hazard would this uh, present if it's blown up? Yeah, this this is actually quite concerning, uh, and, and the reason is because we don't know what the intent is. What's the purpose uh, of these fighters uh, taking over a, a medical a biological facility, which obviously has no military value in, in terms of the fight going on between the two sides? And according to the World Health Organization that reported this this breach, uh, they don't even know right now which side has it, or or, or if it's any of the sides. If it's somebody uh, potentially trying to be a profiteer and potentially gaining some of these pathogens to sell on the black market. That's the biggest concern that I would have is that someone's trying to actually export this to any other nefarious actors, which could just have catastrophic uh, impacts if it's ever released into the public. And, and so I think that, the, you know, it's in the interest of both uh, both sides of this conflict that they need to do whatever they can to secure that building and make sure nothing uh, is escaped from it because it could, it could be harmful to right. everyone. Oh, yeah. Uh, also, I wanted to ask you about uh, what Taiwan's foreign minister uh, recently said. He said the country is gearing up for a possible war with China in 2027. Why 2027? What, what's the significance of that here? Yeah, that, that's actually just a number that was that was uh, really uh, put on the mark on the wall by Admiral Davidson at a congressional testimony several years ago, where in his assessment, uh, China would be capable of uh, complete successfully uh, assaulting the uh, Taiwan Island uh, by 2027. There's really nothing magical about that day. It's just that some experts say that that's when China will basically be, you know, completely ready. And you can watch the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Coming up, tick population expansion. The bug quickly multiplying in one state, raising new concerns about the spread of diseases to people and pets. Taking a look at the top trending stories on our website right now, a historic fighter jet made its final flight this week at the National Museum of the U.S. Air Force, which will now be its permanent home. And Netflix announcing the titles they're slashing from the platform next month. Titles include My Girl and The Edge of Seventeen. And meet Vincent Dransfield. This 109-year-old still drives around New Jersey and says he has no plans of slowing down. When asked how he feels, he said he feels like dancing. Keep it going, Vincent. Those stories much more available right now at thenationaldesk.com.
Looking ahead to top stories making headlines this week, an Arkansas judge has ordered Hunter Biden to appear in court Monday for a contempt hearing in a paternity case. Lyndon Roberts, the mother of one of Hunter's children, accusing him of ignoring previous court orders and withholding evidence. This week, the FAA says it's created a new independent safety review panel following a recent string of close calls at U.S. airports. It will meet next month with plans to recommend safety and reliability improvements in the fall. Former President Donald Trump will be in Scotland and Ireland next week. He's planning to visit golf courses he owns in both countries. He's also expected to do some international media interviews while overseas. The FDA has granted accelerated approval for Toversen. The drug treats a rare form of the neuromuscular disease ALS. Now, this approval requires drug maker Biogen to continue studies to verify its benefits. The FDA said its decision was based on trial results published in 2021, which found it significantly reduces a protein linked to the severity of ALS in patients. Toferson is the first drug for an inherited form of ALS. Meantime, a vaccine for Lyme disease could come as soon as 2025. Axios reports several drug makers are conducting vaccine trials. Moderna is working on two vaccine candidates to protect against the tick-borne illness. And Pfizer and partner Valneva are already in late-stage trials and may be seeking FDA authorization in about two years. The vaccine trials come as concern grows over ticks, becoming a year-round health threat. In Ohio, the state is seeing a significant increase of the bugs. The National Desk Brad Underwood reports from Cincinnati. Ticks are everywhere, and in Ohio, there are more of them now than ever before. And we're on the front lines of tick expansion right now. Tim McDermott is with the Ohio State University Extension Office. He says a decade ago, there were two species of ticks in Ohio. Today, there are five. Movement of wildlife, there is reforestation, there is wildlife coming right up close to where people are in urban environments. There is expansion of ticks due to global climate change. There is the introduction of a true invasive tick. And if that's not bad enough, there isn't really a tick season anymore. The blood-sucking parasites are now a year-round problem. Ticks are a 12-month potential risk now. You know, we do have heightened activity between April and September. The risk of encountering a tick can be any time of the year. And for that reason, some veterinarians are recommending year-round treatment for pets. McDermott supports that. Work with your veterinarian to make sure that you are putting the best products you can on your four-legged friends uh, in order to keep them tick safe. The expansion of ticks in Ohio is also raising health concerns about the spread of Lyme disease and Rocky Mountain fever, as some symptoms are life-threatening. Healthcare workers urge caution outside, like repellent, light clothing, and frequent tick checks. And coming up next here on the National Desk, America's News Now, the Fed chair duped by Russian tricksters. The prank call making its way to Russian state television, who they claim to be on the other end of the line. And a scam artist posing as a fire inspector, the scheme police believe is costing small businesses.
The National Desk, America's News, now. Right now on the national desk, national security threat. The airman accused of leaking classified U.S. intelligence now asking for release and why federal prosecutors are fighting against it. Plus, the U.S. housing market, the high demand and the higher price for the American dream. And opting out of Mother's Day, big businesses changing their marketing. Is it a kind gesture or what some call a war on women? From the nation's capital, this is The National Desk, America's News Now. I'm Dee Dee Gatton. Thanks for being here. New court sketches released this week from the detention hearing for Jack Teixeira. Prosecutors are arguing the 21-year-old should remain in custody during his trial, calling him a flight risk and a national security risk if he's allowed to return home. The 21-year-old airman was charged earlier this month under the Espionage Act for allegedly posting classified intelligence online, including sensitive information on the war in Ukraine. He is yet to enter a plea. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell was tricked into a video interview by Russian pranksters posing as Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. Clips of the video were posted online by a pair of Russian comedians who have pulled similar pranks in the past. A Fed spokesperson confirming Powell spoke with someone back in January who misrepresented themselves. The conversation, which mainly focused on the U.S. economy, didn't reveal anything that wasn't already publicly known. The nation's debt ceiling drama remains in a stalemate. On Wednesday, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy passed the GOP's Limit Save Grow Act of 2023, despite four Republicans voting against it. But the White House's stance remains the same. House Republicans must raise the limit without conditions. Former White House economic advisor Steve Moore sat down with the national desk Jan Jeffcoat to break down the back and forth on the Hill. Let's uh, first talk about the debt limit. In more than 40 years, lawmakers have always come to the table. They've always eventually raised the debt ceiling. So what would be the consequence if we raised it without serious cuts to the budget? Well, that's the big issue here, that uh, Joe Biden wants what he calls a clean debt ceiling, which is basically no strings attached to this, just to raise the federal credit card limit, Jan. And the Republicans are saying, wait a minute, we've got an out-of-control out debt. We're now at $31 trillion. When I first came to Washington 40 years ago, it was $1 trillion. So these are enormous amounts of borrowing. And so Republicans are saying, look, let's negotiate something that gets us on a path towards a balanced budget. That's not unprecedented, John. If you look over the last 30 years or so, there have been many negotiations. Barack Obama, Bill Clinton, Ronald Reagan would negotiate uh, terms for raising the debt ceiling. So we'll see what happens. But right now, Joe Biden's saying, look, I'm not going to negotiate. I want a clean debt ceiling bill and Republicans are insisting on these reforms. So it looks like, <laughs> you know, rock is about to hit a, yeah. a hard place. And it's going to, you know, there's going to have something has to give That's here. That's right. Something's got to give. Uh, according to a CNN article, the $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan, as well as Biden's infrastructure legislation, all created really a big portion of this deficit. But, but Steve, we know the House has the power of the purse. Is there any way for Republicans to essentially do what they want without Biden's approval and withhold funding? And if so, why don't they just do that if, if Biden's not going to negotiate? Hmm. Uh, no, it's going to take it's going to take a handshake agreement, and they have. We don't know when the d drop dead date is, Jan, for when uh, you know we reach that debt limit because things change depending on how the economy is doing, how much revenue comes in. But the latest forecast is that sometime in June or July it, we're going to hit that drop drop dead moment. And I think at the end of the day, Joe Biden is going to have to negotiate with the Republicans. I think his position is not really tenable, given how much the debt has risen. And so the Republicans have in their budget that they're going to pass today, basically they want work requirements for welfare benefits. They want to get rid of the uh, student loan uh, forgiveness program, which costs billions of dollars. They want to have a cap on how much government spending grows over the next few years at 1%. Uh, and those are kind of mostly common sense provisions, yeah. but we will see what, what happens. Um, but I think in the end of the day, Joe Biden is going to have to negotiate something with the Republicans. Right. And they're also wanting to increase energy production and remove some of those regulations. Oh, there's another one, yeah. That's, that, a, good that's a really important one as well. And also roll back some of the uh, IRS 
uh, legislation well, that's there. That's another one. You're exactly right. Jo so <laughs> jo I've got all this in my head. And you're right on top too of much, it, exactly. Too much. <laughs> and that's a big uh, one for the Republicans is. is that IRS funding. The Republicans really don't want this uh, 87,000 new IRS agents. I certainly don't want it, but the Democrats are insistent upon it. So these are some big meaty issues that they're going to be debating. And you can watch the full interview plus more top stories online all the time at thenationaldesk.com. Learning from the coronavirus, a new assessment shows the U.S. might be unprepared for a future pandemic. A group of dozens of experts, including public health policy and biodefense leaders known as the COVID Crisis Group, are behind a book out called Lessons from the COVID War. It points out errors it says both the Trump and Biden administrations made in handling the pandemic. The group recommends better international surveillance and stronger biosecurity regulations. This week, Dr. Anthony Fauci reflecting on the U.S. response to COVID. In an interview with the New York Times, he addresses what he calls missteps and success. He said the political divide was a major hurdle, especially when he says conservatives questioned the benefits of vaccines and wearing masks. When asked how he thought the U.S. reacted compared to other countries, he said, quote, nobody did great except maybe one or two countries. Most everybody did poorly. Even those countries that had no political divisiveness the way we had, they did poorly. There were gaps and in inadequacies in both preparedness and response that varied among different nations. New details now on benefits for veterans exposed to toxic chemicals while they served in the military. The VA says half a million claims have been filed so far. It's part of the largest expansion of veterans affairs coverage in a generation. Congress passed the PACT Act last year, expanding health care coverage to those exposed to burn pits, radioactive material, herbicides and other toxins. The VA says it screened 3 million veterans for toxic exposure and has awarded more than a billion dollars in related benefits to veterans and survivors. The Pentagon now says the U.S. military saw a 1% increase in reports of sexual assault in 2022. An annual fiscal year report found more than 7,300 reports of sexual assault against service members in 2022, up from more than 7,200 reports in 2021. Overall, the number of assault reports has consistently increased in the military since 2010. Why us? New images of the man police are looking to track down accused of scamming a popular D.C. bagel shop. The store owner says the man claimed to be a fire inspector, and it turns out this same guy may be a repeat offender in other major cities. Megan Clark describes how the scam works. Eric. Thank you, Eric. I got a solo cold brew. Eight minutes on a Saturday morning here at Pearl's Bagels in D.C. can mean crowds of customers and just enough time for a crime. At around 1035, he walked in and he was gone with $970 at uh, 1043. Cobra for Eric. Owner Oliver Cox talking about this man caught on video approaching store manager Sophie Temple. He asked to check one of the store's fire prevention systems. He had absolutely all the right jargon. The man then saying he was from the third party company that tags the equipment. Temple got her boss on the phone. He said his name was Jim Stance, which I'm sure is a made up name. The system was due for a check, but in a busy shop, checks are common. The man handed Temple invoices. I've had sandwiches to get out, coffees to make. Temple paid up fake addresses on the invoices. Cox Googled Metro Fire Prevention and found a similar looking suspect caught on video in New Jersey in 2019. In Pittsburgh, police telling 7 News there's an arrest warrant for this man, Nicholas Angelo Carrion, for a similar crime. Cox sending 7 News this invoice from a Manhattan bagel shop with the same address. He sticks to his script. He knows it works. He's effective. While hindsight helps. Helps Cox is now spreading the word. He got us and he's gotten a lot of other people and hopefully he'll get caught. That's our goal. I'm Megan Clark reporting for the National Desk, America's News Now. 
The S&P's home price index shows home prices rose 0.2% in February, the first increase since last June. I'm back with the fact check team tonight. Courtney, why are we seeing these higher prices now? Eugene, it all comes down to supply and demand. Buyers are competing for a very limited number of homes for sale, and with more people wanting to buy houses, sellers can charge a bit more. And according to the National Association of Realtors, right now the average price for a home is nearly $376,000. Home prices rising as the Fed is raising interest rates to cool inflation. So where do mortgage rates stand right now? According to Freddie Mac, as of April 20th, a 30-year fixed rate mortgage averaged 6.39%. But take a look at your screens. You'll see that a year ago, it was just over 5%. And in 2021, it was only 2.97%. Now, despite these higher prices and higher rates, Janae, people still seem to be looking to buy a house. What's the reasoning? Well, Eugene, I spoke with a housing expert from the Bipartisan Policy Center, and he says people are accepting the fact that they will have to pay more and are getting back into the market. Now, is that a wise decision? I was told it is because home prices are going to continue to increase, so that price tag will keep going up, but those mortgage rates will come down, and when they do, homeowners can refinance their loan and get a better rate. Yeah, that's smart. I mean, it's a long game after all. A good info there, ladies. Thank you. For more on this Fact Check Team topic, you want to scan the QR code on your screen or visit us online at thenationaldesk.com. Up next here on the National Desk, America's News Now, air tag danger. How one woman says she knew she was being tracked. Plus, their stores are closing, but their popular coupons are still good. The store offering a deal for Bed Bath & Beyond shoppers. This is the National Desk, America's News Now. Our team of nearly 4,000 local journalists bring you the headlines from coast to coast. From the economic impact of stores closing in Rhode Island to a Virginia teacher trying to help students afford lunch, we're taking the pulse of America. I got the notification on my phone, but I just slid it up because I thought, oh, like we're in traffic, there's other people. Like I wasn't really thinking like, oh, there's an air tag. Victoria Nieto was leaving a concert when she received the first notification on her iPhone that read, air tag found moving with you. She did not open it and the two kept driving. I got another um, notification when I clicked on it and it had a red line mapped on where the air tag had been that night, which is where we had everywhere we had been. And so I was like, oh my goodness. Michael, who did not get any notification on his Android, admits he never would have known that the owner of the AirTag would be tracking him in his pickup. He says he believes this is a targeted incident. I was thinking like people stealing catalytic converters. If you find any form of tracking device on your vehicle, you should report it to police so they can investigate. After posting about it, I realized that there were ways that we could have found who the AirTag belonged to, and then we could have taken it to the police possibly. Bed Bath & Beyond announced its filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. They join the growing number of retailers that are really struggling in a post-COVID world in a dynamic retailing environment where shoppers have kind of switched to e-commerce but have come back to the stores. Bed Bath & Beyond used to be the place to go for a wedding or baby registry. But other online brands like Amazon are doing that now too. Supply chain issues haven't helped either. The company has already closed dozens of stores recently. People aren't going to come to the stores if there's empty shelves. And Bed Bath & Beyond has been struggling with paying their vendors, getting getting product on the shelves. The company says if it finds a buyer, it will pivot away from closing. May 9th is really the pivotal point to see if they're going to be able to keep those stores open. 
Eighth grade teacher Gabriel Siegel knows his students here at Hornton Middle School in Fairfax County. The first question I ask him isn't, hey, are you okay or how are you? It's, did you eat today? Because the majority of the time they're not eating. A problem Siegel first noticed talking to parents before the pandemic. I learned that this was a common theme of school meal debt. In Fairfax County, middle school meals cost $3.50 with a half pint of milk, $4.10. About a third of students do get free meals or help to pay. 24% of residents in Fairfax County, where the median household income is more than $100,000, struggle with food insecurity. So if you have a family of four and they're all eating lunch, that can quickly add up. He's raised even more for a total of more than $40,000. Meal debt in Fairfax County is nearing a million dollars. He wants to keep the message going, now meeting with county and state leaders to get free lunches in all Virginia schools, no matter what parents make. Because a lot of families need help. I mean, it's just that simple. So to come here, our team of correspondents breaking down this week in Washington from the top players in the 2024 election to the crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border as Title 42 nears its expiration. That's coming up next. And welcome back. Our Washington Bureau covers the nation's capital every day to report on the important issues facing the country and how they impact you. The Bureau's correspondents are here with their insights on the stories they've been covering. Chief political correspondent Scott Thuman, the nation's gross domestic product shrinking in the first quarter of this year, adding to concerns about the economy and inflation. Will this be the defining issue for next year's elections? Well, a lot of Republicans, Steve, sure would like it to be because it rates as a top issue for most voters talking about the economy and fears of recession would only help them say it's time for regime change. You look at some recent Fox News poll numbers show that 70 percent of people say that they think the economy is getting worse. Forty percent say Biden's policies are hurting the economy. Only 24 percent say it's helping. So that's where you'll see this divide. Biden, of course, has his own numbers. The president saying, look, we've created 12 million jobs since I got into office and unemployment is at a near 50 year low. So I do have answers. Some of these things take time. You have to be patient, but we're going to get that economy right back where it should be. Meanwhile, a key issue for Republicans national correspondent Christine Frizzau is the crisis at the U.S.-Mexico border. New developments this past week there. What's going on? Yeah, first of all, Steve, the clock is ticking. Two weeks from today, the public health order uh, Title 42 is going to expire. We are hearing reports of more and more tents lining up in places like Juarez, Mexico. These are people who are going to camp out there. They've traveled from near and far, and they plan to come to the United States when Title 42 expires. It had been used to quickly expel people and deport them. But I also spoke yesterday to my source on the ground and he said, you know, a lot of these detention facilities, they are packed. They've filled up with people who are just so sick of waiting it out. And what we've seen this week, places like Brownsville, Texas, 2,000 people a day coming over, being apprehended at the border. So they are overwhelmed. This is, of course, a huge uh, focus for Congress. Congress also looking at something that we recently found out that has been really shocking here in Washington, and that is a lot of the child migrants who come over here. Turns out they haven't just gone to their family members or vetted sponsors. They have gone to people who have put them to work, kids as young as 10 years old working in factories. Uh, this is a really big problem, Republicans say, they want answers. And the border, an issue that Republicans are going to try to use, I think, in next year's election. Another issue uh, that Republicans, national correspondent Kayla Gaskins, are trying to use is this issue uh, on banning sex change procedures for minors. Montana, the latest state to move toward that. Um, this is what transgender rights supporters are calling gender-affirming care. What's the debate all about? 
Well, the country is still very divided on the best way to care for transgender uh, children. Now, Montana is looking to join about 10 other states that have already placed bans on these transgender medical procedures. We're talking about things like puberty blockers and surgeries, uh, transgender surgeries for kids under the age of 18. So about 10 states have already put those bans in place and more states are looking at doing their own legislation. Of course, that's being met with some backlash, especially from the left and some lawsuits already. A lawsuit was filed by the ACLU in Indiana for their state ban there. And then the families of some transgender kids are suing the state of Florida for their ban. And Steve, the latest is the DOJ now jumping in and they've uh, filed a lawsuit against the state of Tennessee for their ban saying that Tennessee's ban on uh, this type of medical treatment for transgender children goes against uh, the 14th Amendment. So that's the latest there, and uh, we'll continue to watch these lawsuits. Yeah, an issue we'll be covering very closely, I'm sure. Kayla Gaskins, Christine Frizzow, Scott Thuman, thank you all for your hard work. Back to you. Thank you. Still ahead here on the National Desk, skipping Mother's Day, how major companies are rebranding during the holiday and the concern from conservatives. That's coming up next. Mother's Day is about two weeks away, and this year more companies are sending customers the option of opting out of Mother's Day marketing emails. For some who are grieving the loss of their mother, this could be helpful, though others say it's yet another war on a beloved holiday. Here's the National Desk, Christine Fazau. I love it. It started back in 1908, recognized by Congress in 1914 as a way to honor sacrifices mothers made for their children. But its founder, Anna Jarvis of West Virginia, later fought unsuccessfully to have Mother's Day abolished, having become in her mind more focused on revenue than recognition. More than 100 years later, Mother's Day is embedded in our society, though some critics warn of a new war on the holiday after multiple companies have given people the option to opt out of Mother's Day marketing emails for those for whom it may be a challenging or difficult time. Conservatives like Charlie Kirk tweeting, brands are bending over backwards to let customers opt out of Mother's Day, adding, can we opt out of Pride Month spam too? Former Trump aide Stephen Miller asserting the left's war on womanhood, motherhood and childhood continues to gather force. Critics worry so-called trigger warnings could make society weaker. What they do is reinforce the idea that trauma is central to your identity and that you should let it define you instead of dealing with it, dispatching it and moving beyond it. 
People wonder why the younger generations have so much anxiety. It's this stuff. But many others have expressed appreciation for the extra consideration. Whether you're trying to conceive recently, um, lost a pregnancy, Mother's Day may bring some mixed emotions. Psychologist Dr. Claire Nikogosian wrote the book Mama, You Are Enough and says opting out is different from avoiding. Being able to have the agency when something traumatic has happened to say, I choose right now not to participate in that, can be part of the healing. As far as Mother's Day itself, there appears to be no sign of a slowdown. Last year, the National Retail Federation reported Americans plan to spend more than $31 billion on the holiday, up from more than $3 billion just the year before. I'm Christine Frizzau, reporting for the National Desk. America's News Now. Christine, thank you. And don't throw away your Bed Bath & Beyond coupons just yet. One competitor announced it will take them for a limited time. The container store said it will offer a 20% discount on a single item when customers bring in a Bed Bath & Beyond coupon through May 31st. Bed Bath & Beyond stopped accepting coupons earlier this week, just days after announcing it filed for bankruptcy. That's going to do it for us on the weekend edition of the National Desk, America's News Now. Don't forget, you can catch us live from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and 10 p.m. to midnight Eastern time. Just check your local listings. You can also watch us online and catch up with the latest headlines on thenationaldesk.com. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here next week.